by far one of the most common questions we get is how come I can't get under the bar at heavy weights? Or why do I clerk snatches? Or why can I power snatch more than I can full snatch? These are all essentially the same question. For non-weightlifters, the snatch is a notoriously technical lift, which requires the athlete to pull the barbell from the floor to overhead in one smooth movement, usually catching it in the bottom of a deep overhead squat, having pulled initially on the barbell to achieve a certain bar height, and then pulling themselves underneath it. Now, the issue is in this pulling underneath phase most of the time. The issue which most beginner lifters face is that the act of pulling yourself underneath a heavy weight is difficult, both technically and psychologically. You're asking yourself to put your body in danger and gamble on the fact that you'll be able to catch this weight at the peak of its trajectory and fixate the load before it crushes you or gains downward momentum. Okay, so let's just briefly break this down for a sec. Most of the time we think of a snatch as this. We start with the barbell all the way on the floor and we finish with the barbell all the way overhead. But what we commonly don't think about is the small amount of fall or that kind of resetting as we go from bringing the barbell up off the floor to bringing ourselves underneath it. So total bar height is something people always think about. They think about it when they compare power snatches to full snatches. They think about it when they can't make a lift or bring the barbell up high and up off the ground. They think about getting that barbell higher. Oftentimes though, total bar height isn't really what we need to think about. It's this kind of total height of fixation. So although we might do a really good job of pulling that bar really high, if you're not bringing yourself underneath the bar very well, this height of fixation, or essentially the amount of distance it takes us to stop the barbell from falling back down again, is a very, very important aspect. This downward trajectory of the bar is where a lot of people start losing confidence. So they'll constantly think about pulling the bar higher, maybe they've attempted a 1RM, they'll go to pull the bar higher again, they'll try and loosen up even more as they pull underneath, they'll try and pull underneath faster and to a lower depth, and what we're oftentimes doing is increasing this height of fixation. So this total amount of time it takes to put the brakes on. Now we talk a lot about people being very skilled when they can contract and then relax a muscle as fast as possible. And a lot of the skill in the snatch is down to this timing, this ability to go from maximal contraction to maximal relaxation to maximal contraction again. So there are a number of challenges to pulling ourselves under the bar. But the list doesn't just stop there. As most of you will have probably experienced, it is far harder to pull ourselves or get ourselves to pull underneath the barbell as we approach one rep max. And this of course isn't just due to the bar height being lower. As the weights get heavier, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain good positions. The ability of our own structure to resist the pull of heavy weights becomes severely sacrificed. Take the most simple example of this, the deadlift. Most of the time, we can maintain a flat back during the deadlift, but this becomes more and more of an issue as the weight increases, with all of this eventually resulting in us morphing into some sort of hunchback of Notre Dame as we approach maximal weights. Next then is the fact that the barbell has a far greater influence over us as its mass increases. So not only does it affect our positions, but the force it puts upon our frame increases too. So in the catch portion of the lift, the force coming from the barbell increases significantly. This force is coming from the fact that we've given the barbell potential energy, we've lifted a mass against gravity, and now as it builds up speed, it's gaining kinetic energy. This kinetic energy can be quantified as half the mass of the barbell multiplied by its velocity squared. But this isn't just as simple as the heavier mass creating an increase in momentum although it is. But in beginner and intermediate lifters, a common response to the weights being heavier and us missing previous attempts is that we try and pull the barbell higher. This total barbell height then results in the bar gaining more velocity as it falls back down on us, thus increasing the kinetic energy. And so as the formula states, the velocity is a far more important factor. So, when we start altering mechanics of the pull to get higher barbell height 
and us pulling ourselves under even faster, we're actually having an exponential effect on the force that's being exerted upon us. And this exponentially larger force is catching us at pretty much our weakest point. We're sitting in the bottom of an overhead squat, an overhead squat we may not be all that confident in in the first place. Finally then, when the weights increase in the snatch, most of us, or at least most of us who have learned weightlifting in the past 20 years, will make more hip contact, more hip smash, and therefore more horizontal bar displacement. Unfortunately, this is just the nature of learning the snatch. Now, this is coming from a good place, right? The wonderful land of good intentions. We want to put more height on the heavier barbell and our idiot brains think more, more, more. But in many ways, we'd be better limiting this hip smash and allowing the barbell to have a straighter and more efficient bar path. These of course aren't the only technical errors which become far more prevalent at heavier or near maximal weights. Jumping backwards, lack of foot movement, soft elbows in the catch, all of these things are far more prevalent as the weights increase. It's just the nature of highly technical lifts. Once the weights get heavier, it becomes difficult to maintain good technique. But today's video isn't about biomechanics. It's not even about weightlifting really. It's me talking, Darfit, the psychology guy, Sika psychology, not that other ginger nerd. So what's the psychological element of clerking lifts? So let's start off by defining confidence and particularly confidence in sport. Well, to reference Vili in a 1986 paper, confidence is the belief or degree of certainty an individual possesses about their ability to, su to be successful in a sport. This is a really interesting concept because it's a sport-specific definition of self-confidence, and it's from a paper, The Conceptualization of Sports Confidence and Competitive Orientation. You can find that paper in the references down below. Now, we commonly understand confidence as a state which changes depending on the task, the environment and a number of other variables. And so it's important to note that confidence isn't just a trait. It's not inherent across all aspects of an individual's personality and it's not even steady across an athlete's entire performance. This addresses the degree to which an athlete is sure of his or her ability. Now, this seems quite simple and it is, but what about we start to break it down and look into the particular aspects of why someone might be missing these maximal lifts? Could it be an issue with confidence or lack thereof? Well, yeah, it definitely could be. The point which stands out to me here is that so many athletes are self-reporting as a lack of confidence of I just can't get under the barbell or I just can't drop into the full snatch at a certain point or above a certain weight. So what can we do to help here? Well, firstly, let's investigate what aspects lead to confidence in sport. So to go back to a previous video, right, and to find a table we looked at before, this table is from the Handbook of Sports Medicine, the Sports Psychology Edition, the chapter on confidence. You can actually read this for free online. I'll put a reference down below. In this, we can see that different aspects of self-confidence are needed for an athlete to be confident in their sport. We see outcome self-confidence, performance self-confidence, physical self-confidence, and self-regulatory self-confidence. So where I think many weightlifters should start is by listing out our six elements of sport self-confidence. How confident are we in our skill acquisition, skill learning, physical fitness, cognitive management, emotional management, and our resilience? These may seem complicated, and this task may seem to be a bit excessive for you just missing snatches, but honestly, it will take five minutes. Just take out a piece of paper and write out those six headings. Now, let's start with skill execution self-confidence. How confident are you in your skill execution? Are you confident in your ability to execute the skill of the snatch repeatedly in the exact manner you see fit with a technique you and your coach are happy with? Let's just do a simple rating out of 10. If I take a skill I'm incredibly comfortable with, such as, say for me, it would be shooting a rifle, I can say I have a 10 out of 10 rating for self-confidence in that aspect. But maybe if it's something I'm less experienced at, like a certain aspect of BJJ, I might be as low as a 2. What I want you to do now is think about your snatch and the skill of you doing your snatch and how confident you are in that skill. 
give it a rating out of 10 and we'll move on. Next, we have skill learning self-confidence. Now, this one is a bit different from skill execution as it revolves directly around our ability to learn. The very nature of the snatch is that it is difficult to learn. There are many, many different aspects to it and each piece is inherently linked. So if you change one aspect of your technique, like learning a new bar path or grip width, you may have to relearn the lift entirely or multiple different aspects of the lift. But the good thing about skill learning self-confidence is that it's accumulative. The process of becoming a better learner is well studied and we can understand how to learn things better. So now, when you're thinking about your own snatch technique, how confident are you in the ability to learn new aspects, such as more efficient technique, better movement patterns, and so on? We all know athletes who are afraid to change their technique. You may be one of those athletes yourself, but this may be down to a lack of self-confidence in learning the skill necessary to change, and so now when you think about it, how open to you to learning new skills and new aspects or altering pieces of your own technique? In the same way as last time, give it a rating and we'll come back to it in a bit. Physical fitness is next. So this is probably the easiest to quantify how confident you are in your own particular physical fitness for the snatch, whether, whether it's strength, power, uh, velocity, whatever it is, how strong do you feel? Do you feel fast? Does your body feel good prior to the sessions? All of this is something we commonly think about anyway. And so when we're rating it, it's quite simple. How confident are you in the current shape you're in for snatches? Cognitive management then is the next one. Now, cognitive management in sports can be thought of as your ability to focus, concentrate and make decisions throughout the performance window. For the snatch, this performance window is quite short, usually 20 to 30 minutes of training will have us finished all of our snatches, and so managing our cognition is definitely very doable. But you'd be really surprised how many people have poor ratings in this area of their own particular self-confidence. Things like tiredness, stress, and task load have a massive bearing on cognitive management self-confidence, and we oftentimes see large variance in this area. So, Take a minute to think about this one. How confident are you in your ability to manage your cognition while training or competing? Once again, just rate it out of 10. Moving on then, emotional management is our penultimate area of self-confidence. So how confident are you in your ability to control your temper when you start listing lifts? Are you confident you'll be able to take a step back, assess, make a better attempt? Or on the other hand, are you worried you'll throw the toys out of the pram and threaten to derail the entire session? Nothing kills an athlete's self-confidence like lack of emotional management or, more particularly in this case, a lack of confidence in their own emotional management. Now, emotional management isn't an easy fix. We can't simply do a prep phase and hope it improves like we would do at physical fitness or something along those lines. It would have been far better if this kind of emotional management work was done in developmental years when they were learning the sport or if they had gotten into the sport a small bit earlier. But it is possible to improve emotional control and from there improve an athlete's self-confidence in their emotional control. So... Have a quick think about it, give it a rating. This one is a bit more abstract than the previous ones. Finally then is resilience, right? So many people wrongly think resilience is a personality trait characterized by perseverance and passion for achieving long-term goals, but it's not. That's, that's a definition of grit, right? This kind of perseverance, this passion, pushing through things no matter how hard they are, that's grit, that's not resilience. Resilience is all about successful adaptation during challenging times. A player breaking their arm and continuing to play doesn't show resilience, it shows grit. A player breaking their arm and diligently taking time off and doing all the boring rehab work for months and months in order to return to training, that shows resilience. How confident are you in your resilience? So are you sure you'll be able to deal with shitty situations in training? Are you confident you'll be able to do another 20 weeks of hard training, even if you know you may not win nationals again next year? This is a difficult one. How confident are you in your resilience? Because most of the time, we'll go back to negative thought patterns with this. Oh, 
I got knocked out in the second round of the league and I stopped training for a month or I didn't get the result I wanted so I derailed the rest of the competition. Whatever it is, this one can be quite difficult to quantify but just give it a rating. Okay, so assuming you've gotten this far in the video, you probably have resonated with one of these areas or maybe you've identified something that could be a problem in your game, right? And if we take these six categories and we start looking into different ways we could improve them, there are certain skills, certain tools, certain intervention pieces that certainly from a sports psychology and from a strength and conditioning point of view, you can work on these kind of errors or these deficits you may have. In our first category, we talked about skill execution. So there's some things that are very, very important for skill execution. And the first of these will be specific training. So a lot of the time in training programs, whether it be in weightlifting, powerlifting, or in general sports, we'll see a lack of specificity, and particularly a lack of specificity as we're getting closer towards the season or closer towards the performance itself. So a lot of time you might do a prep phase where you have very high reps, you might have a lot of power variations or hang variations, but as you get close to competition or as you get close to a specific time where it's very important to perform, it's very important that your training is highly, highly specific. The next thing then following on from that high level of specificity should be that you should be in the best position possible to execute on those skills. So in this kind of skill execution piece, oftentimes people will think about, oh, I need to be highly coordinated or I need to have this high level of motor cognition. All of that is really important. But to be honest, no matter how skilled a performer you are, if you're sleep deprivated, if you're highly stressed, if you're highly fatigued from training, if your recovery values aren't good, then you're not really ever going to be able to perform a skill to the best of your abilities besides all of the other factors that could be going wrong. The last part of this then is a technical focus. So a lot of the time in different times of training or different periods of training, our focus will be elsewhere aside from the technical aspect of the lifts. It might be in building work capacity, it might be in building general strength, it might be in increasing speed or power numbers, but it may not be focused on the technical aspect. If we're looking for the best skill execution possible, we need to make sure we're prioritizing high skill and highly technical pieces of the lift and make sure we're putting most of our focus and most of our energy on the technique. That may involve sacrificing things like absolute weight, absolute speed, total training volume or total volume load in training. But if you're really looking for the best skill execution possible, this is where you have to be focusing. The second thing we talked about then was skill learning. So skill learning is a really highly studied topic in uh, performance psychology and in sports psychology in general. The first thing is you can get a lot better at learning skills. Just to start off with, you need to make sure you're obviously in the best position possible. You need to make sure your, your sleep is at its best point possible, your recovery is in its best point possible. But then you look at things like whole part whole models, you look at different pedagogy modules, different modalities of teaching a lift, and you can get a hell of a lot better at learning a skill rather than just trying to constantly repeat what you've done in the past. So if you're somebody who's been weightlifting for a year or two years or five years or 10 years, and you haven't managed to learn a particular aspect of the skill or you've never been good at altering your skill in a certain area, it could be because you're teaching yourself wrong and not really paying attention to where you should be going. So something like a whole part whole model where you start off with some full snatches, full snatch might identify a deficit in your technique in some areas, say you're not moving your feet, you might then go to a part. So a part would be some derivation of the lift, a, a, in this case, a derivation that would make it easier to move your feet or incentivize you to move your feet. Um, so it might be going to a power snatch to parallel for a number of reps or a number of sets, and then going back to a whole snatch, a full snatch, a non-derivation of the snatch afterwards. There are multiple different aspects of pedagogy you can look into, and just that skill of learning can really be, be refined and maybe where your current deficit lies. Physical fitness then is the next one. So physical fitness is undeniable, right? You're not going to be confident to go out and run a marathon if you've never done any runs before. 
in the same way for weightlifting, although you may be lifting heavy enough weights, 85 to 90% of one rep max, you might be lifting them quite consistently. But if your general work capacity isn't there, your strength isn't there, your power isn't there, your speed isn't there, or one of those aspects that we find to be important for weightlifting, if one of those is lacking, you're always going to lack confidence. Physical fitness and self-confidence in your own physical fitness is a massive part of our general self-confidence with a sport. So don't dismiss this. Uh, a lot of the time people will always want to be hyper-focused on the the kind of particular aspect itself. You know, we might be looking at a crack in the wall, but we're not looking at the foundation underneath. And in this case, people becoming more physically fit, more physically competent. In the case of skill learning, it might be more physically literate, so learning more of the general skills that we all kind of acquire over a lifetime. This adds massively to our confidence. And if you've been hyper-focused on just the technical aspects of the lift, maybe it is time to go for a prep phase. Maybe it is time to do some general work capacity stuff. Make yourself be in a bit better shape. Maybe a bit less body fat. Maybe hold more muscle. Maybe be at a better, better body weight for you yourself. All of these things will certainly add to your self-confidence and your self-confidence within the sport itself. Now on to our three kind of psychological components, right? The cognitive management, the emotional management, and the resilience piece that we spoke about earlier. So the cognitive management is very, very important. It's a vital part of sport. And I think the first place we should look is on concentration. So concentration to kind of define it or to, to give it some meaning is basically attentional focus, right? Being able to pick a stimulus, focus on that particular stimulus and process all the things we need to, and then block out all of that noxious stimulus. It's all about controlling our attention. Now, we can't have good cognitive management if we're not concentrating on the task in hand. Now, oftentimes players will use something like a reset or a real time reset during their performance to help them with concentration. Oftentimes it may be a certain intervention they'll use prior to the sporting performance itself. But if you're not concentrating during sessions, you're never ever going to be able to perform the highest level of skill, the highest level of work output, or just to your highest or best abilities. Other things that can help with cognitive management are certain psychological interventions such as journaling or framing. We speak about these a lot on the channel. An interesting thing when we look at cognitive management and when we look at concentration in particular, if we're coming into a training session with a large amount of what we may refer to as additional cognitive stimulus or noxious stimulus that isn't important to the particular task, it's going to be very difficult to divide up that cognitive attention, right? So we only have a certain amount of attention we can give to any particular task. If my attention is now divided between uh, something in my personal life, something that's happening in work, something that's happening in the training session, and then uh, some other stressor I have going on, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to concentrate. Uh, what framing will allow us to do is basically alter our perception of the current situation we're in. And so a framing intervention in this place can be very, very good. An additional thing which can be very useful is the use of journaling in our everyday life. So what journaling does is it basically allows us to take everything that's in our head, place it down, allow it to have context in the world as we verbalize it first and then as we write it out and give it structure on the page we allow us ourselves to remove a lot of that noxious stimulus from our head so it might be something as as simple as if you're in a high stress environment at work a small amount of journaling after you finished your work day which might just be writing out the eight tasks you completed that day closing that book and finishing your work day something like that where we're giving all of that noxious stimuli some context we initially verbalize it in our head then we write it out on a piece of paper or we use a notes app on our computer something like that can really help to divert a lot of that attention and to kind of secure it away somewhere where we know we've we've secured those ideas for tomorrow we've documented those important thoughts and that important piece of our attention and then when you go to work in the morning you can open up that book it's all there you won't have to constantly think about remembering it it's essentially a to-do list for your cognition then we move on to something a small but more opaque right and emotional management while performing the sport we gave multiple uh, examples of emotional management or poor emotional management earlier and 
the, the general thing you want to think about here is you initially need to limit the stressors you have so limit the emotional stressors you have going on both in training itself in sport itself but also in your your everyday life and then you need to have better tools for dealing with those emotional stressors so the the most important part here is the tools go all the way from these very simple interventionalist pieces maybe a mindfulness app on your phone all the way through to full professional CBT cognitive behavioral therapy there's a, a large remit of things we can work on in this and it's not necessarily something we can get into today's video because we don't have the time or the, the scope to go into it today but there's a massive amount of stuff available for us out there if you find yourself very very emotionally invested in sessions if you find that you're getting really upset after sessions go badly or you're only really happy when sessions go well then there's a, a large remit of stuff available to you and and Today's just about making you aware of that that group of things available to you. We're not necessarily going to go into it too much. One thing I do want to finish on on the, the emotional management piece is that far too many people have their entire identities wrapped up in the sport or the training they do. Their main personality trait is that they go to the gym and train or that they compete in weightlifting or whatever. Look, it's not necessarily a problem that you love your sport, but... Sport is something that is incredibly fleeting. It can be taken from us in a matter of seconds and you may never ever be able to comp compete in the sport or train in the sport again. And no matter how comfortable you are in your current situation, if everything in your life revolves around the gym or the training environment or competing or the sport itself, if all of your friends are wrapped up in that sport, you're really leaving yourself in a very, very vulnerable position and because of that, your ability to perform in the sport is undoubtedly compromised. You need to make sure that you don't put too much pressure on the shoulders of the sport. The sport is its own thing. Your ability to perform in the sport is its own thing. And you really have to, to give it that. It's credence. Don't put everything else on it. Don't put all of your positive relationships in your life wrapped up in it. Make sure you have other things going on aside from the sport. The last piece then is resilience. And there are countless phenomenal resources out there on building your resilience. The first thing and the main thing I want you to concentrate on for today is that your resilience is not about being a tough fucker and being able to come back from anything. You know, that's not what resilience is. We talk about resilience all the time. Resilience is about making positive alterations in the face of noxious stimuli or in the face of adverse conditions so it's it's really important you get your head away from this thing of no matter how hard it is i'm going to push through that's not what resilience is that's not positive that's not good that's not good as an athlete it's not good for sport in general right you becoming more resilient can be done through a number of of interventionist models all the way from something like wim hof and and his particular suite of things all the way through to to direct work with a sports psychologist and you work on becoming a more resilient athlete or a more resilient person or a more resilient employee, right? Whatever it is. There are an unbelievable amount of resources out there on resilience. If you have questions about any of the resources I brought up today, please do let me know in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed today's video. I hope you enjoy the format of these videos and the kind of slightly longer videos. Let me know your thoughts on that. If there's aspects of sports psychology you'd like to see a long video on or a short video on, please do let me know and I'll talk to you all again soon.